Um, Asa, in the past week, you published uh, a phenomenal report uh, based on information that uh, was only published in Hebrew, I think, still uh, to this day, about um, more on the Hannibal Directive ordered by Israeli commanders to uh, have their troops fire on Israeli civilians on October 7th. Um, and you've prepared uh, you know, a, a presentation here about uh, that report and these findings, and and so let's get into it. Okay, thank you very much, Nora. Do you remember this video from the aftermath of the 7th of October assault? Hundreds of destroyed cars were rounded up by the Israeli military and later piled up in a car lot in Netivot, an Israeli settlement near Gaza. Would it shock you to learn that much of this destruction was caused not by Palestinians, but by Israel? If you're one of our regular viewers or listeners, this won't come as a surprise. But now a major new investigative piece by two Israeli journalists shows that official Israeli estimates have privately concluded that at least 70 of these vehicles were blown up by Israel. That is to say by helicopter gunships, drones or tanks. Many of these vehicles driven by Palestinian fighters on their way back to Gaza contained Israelis that they had taken captive. This new piece that you can see here was published in seven days, which is the weekend supplement of the mainstream Israeli newspaper Yadiot Ahronot. And this piece confirms what we've been saying all along, which is that Israel reactivated the Hannibal Directive on the 7th of October. Journalists Ronan Bergman and Yorav Zitun wrote that it is not clear at this stage how many of the captives were killed due to the operation of this order. That is uh, an order to the Air Force that they should prevent return to Gaza at all costs. And a quote from the article, at least in some of the cases, everyone in the vehicle was killed. The journalist explained. Now, that, of course, would have included many Israeli captives. Now, the paper's online version, Ynet, has not translated the piece into English. Um, so we asked our longtime professional Hebrew translator and Israel expert, Dina Shunra, to translate it for us. So all quotes of the article that I'm reading now are taken from that translation, and you can read the, it in its entirety at the end of this uh, report that I've written uh, um, at the electronic intifada.net. So we'll put a link to it in the description for this episode. Now, Bergman and Zitun's investigation found that at midday on the 7th of October, Israel's Supreme Military Headquarters ordered all units to prevent the capture of Israeli citizens, quote, at any cost, unquote, including by firing on them. Quote, at midday of October 7th, the IDF instructed all its fighting units to perform the Hannibal Directive in practice, although it did so without stating that name explicitly, end of quote. As the Israeli piece explains, and as we've reported in detail recently, the Hannibal Directive was established in 1986 after the capture of two Israeli soldiers in then-occupied southern Lebanon by fighters from the Lebanese resistance group Hezbollah. The secretive Hannibal Doctrine is named after an ancient Carthaginian general who poisoned himself instead of being captured alive by the Roman Empire. Now, Bergman and Zaytun say that the original wording of the Hannibal Directive ordered Israeli forces to, quote, halt the capturing force at any price, and that, quote, in the course of a capture, the main task becomes rescuing our soldiers from the captors, even at the price of hitting or injuring our soldiers, end of quote. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I think that the concept of rescuing Israelis by shooting at them is an interesting one, to say the least. In 2016, the Israeli military claimed that the Hannibal Doctrine had been revoked or at least clarified. 
depending on uh, which reports you believe. But as we've been saying for the past four months, all indications were in reality that Israel had revived the Hannibal Directive and has been using it to kill Israelis since the Palestinian military offensive that began on the 7th of October. Bergman and Zaytun's new article is the first confirmation by Israeli media, no less, that there was a specific order from the top of Israel's military hierarchy to reactivate this suicidal military doctrine on the 7th of October. Bergman and Zaytun's article says that at midday on the 7th of October, the Israeli military, quote, decided to return to a version of the Hannibal Directive. They write that, quote, the instruction was to stop at any cost, any attempt by Hamas terrorists, I'm quoting from them, to return to Gaza using language very similar to that of the original Hannibal Directive, despite repeated promises by the defense apparatus that the directive had been cancelled, end of quote. Now, none of this means that the attack that began on the 7th of October was a false flag, or even that Palestinians didn't kill any civilians at all. But what it does mean is that in the words of another Israeli article, which we reported on last month, quote, casualties fell as a result of friendly fire on October 7th, but the Israeli, but, but the IDF believes that beyond the operational investigations of the events, it would not be morally sound to investigate these incidents due to the immense and complex quantity of them that took place. An immense and complex quantity of friendly fire, but neither was, yeah, it, that's what it says there. It says that there was an immense and complex quantity of friendly fire. It, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea. But neither was the 7th of October a massacre of Israeli civilians by Palestinian terrorists, the way it's been portrayed by the mainstream media. Rather, it was a carefully calculated military offensive planned for possibly as long as two years in advance. It was aimed overwhelmingly at military targets. Hamas insists that it did not aim to kill civilians, but that some faults may have occurred. Rather, its targets were military bases and outposts, as well as the militarized Israeli settlements along the frontier with Gaza, which by their very nature blurred the distinction between military and civilian targets and act as human shields for the Israeli military. Indeed, one of the Gaza frontier settlements, Magen, is literally the Hebrew word for shield. Hamas says that it aimed to kill or capture Israeli soldiers. To quote, our narrative, this document you can see on the screen here, which was recently released by Hamas. Quote, Operation Al-Aqsa Flood on October 7 targeted Israeli military sites and sought to arrest the enemy soldiers to put pressure on the Israeli authorities to release the thousands of Palestinians held in Israeli jails through a prisoner exchange deal. Therefore, the operation focused on destroying the Israeli army's Gaza division, the Israeli military sites stationed near the Israeli settlements around Gaza. End of quote. Hamas's military assault was well planned and very precisely executed. And the Bergman Zitun article provides a large amount of new evidence confirming this. Hundreds of Israeli soldiers were killed and about 240 Israelis were captured, including dozens of soldiers. Civilians were also taken prisoner, but Hamas offered to release them right away and actually did release them as soon as it was physically possible to do so during the week-long pause in fighting in November. The 7th of October was an unprecedented military success for the Palestinian resistance. To quote the words of a very senior Israeli military officer in the Bergman and Zatun article, the Gaza division was overpowered. The journalist sources watched the day unfold from the Israeli military's supreme military uh, command position, which is an underground bunker deep below Tel Aviv, known as the pit. The journalists recount that, quote, there was an almost total shock and such words 
ha, quote, had not been heard since the Yom Kippur War of October 1973. In fact, the pit was almost totally in the dark. They had no clue about the scale of what was happening on the ground. According to Bergman and Zaytun, quote, they turned to television and to social media feeds, to telegram, primarily to Hamas channels. End of quote. The reason for this intelligence failure was quite simple. Hamas had skillfully targeted the communications infrastructure. Another quote. A, plen a preliminary investigation held in the last few days about the communication capacity of the Gaza division exposed the fact that some 40% of the communication sites, such as towers with relay antennas, that the telecommunications department had deployed in recent years near the Gaza Strip border were destroyed by Hamas on the morning of the invasion. Soon after the first videos of the Israeli captives emerged at midday, Israel's top military headquarters issued the order to all units to carry out the Hannibal Directive, Israel's suicidal military doctrine. The, ar the article also confirms a lot of the Electronic Intifada's previous reporting since the 7th of October about that day. In November, we reported on Israeli air footage, as well as interviews with attack helicopter pilots, showing that they had been ordered to shoot at everything. That, that's a quote from an article, shoot at everything, moving between Israel's frontier settlements and Gaza. That Israeli article stated that, quote, in the first four hours, helicopters and fighter craft attacked about 300 targets, most in Israeli territory. You can see the footage of it there. Now, Bergman and Zatun's new article uh, confirms this and actually expands on it, saying that by the end of the day, Drone Squadron 161 alone, quote, performed no fewer than 110 attacks on some 1,000 targets, most of which were inside Israel, end of quote. Uh, as we reported in English for the first time, Israeli news media last month showed footage of tank operators that you can see here, firing at Israeli homes inside a kibbutz during the battles with the Palestinian resistance on the 7th of October. This in turn confirmed our reports back in October about the testimony of Yasmin Parat, and we were the first to report on that in English. She was one of only two survivors of an Israeli attack on her home in Kibbutz Be'eri. That building contained around a dozen uh, captives held by Palestinian fighters, and Parat told Israeli media that the Palestinians had treated them humanely. But she said that the Israeli army ended a standoff with the fighters by deliberately tank shelling the house, even though the captives were still present and she and one other woman were the only survivors of that. Porat later elaborated that the casualties of the Israeli attack included this girl, 12 year old Israeli captive, Liel Hatzroni. Now Hatzroni's photo, um, you may have seen it, was later used in propaganda by Israeli officials who wrongly claimed she had been burnt alive by Hamas because she's Jewish was what Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister, said. You can see him lying here in this tweet. Now, although it's being aggressively ignored by mainstream media in the West, who are even trying to punish independent journalists like us who report accurately on this, Israel's suicidal military doctrine is making waves inside Israeli society. We are killing our people, was how one family member of the captives pleaded. Families of the captives want to see their loved ones come home safely and are pushing for the Israeli government for that to happen by agreeing to a prisoner exchange deal with Hamas that would release all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Even Asa Kasher, the author of the Israeli army's so-called code of ethics, agrees with the families and is now calling for an immediate investigation of how the Hannibal Directive was used. But the reality seems to be that the Israeli government doesn't want the captives to come home alive, since the price of that would be a prisoner exchange deal to release the Palestinians. And that's why it has unleashed 
the Hannibal Directive. You can read more about all this in my article and also remember that we've published the full text of the English translation of that Bergman Zetun article appended to my own piece so you can read that in full there. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.